Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that, that kind in introduction and that very truthful uh, concluding statement about having learned from my kids. Um, and thank you to everyone who's hosted me here. This has been a, a wonderful opportunity to get to know a lot of folks here. And the campus has been terrific. This guy is wonderful. Uh, I'm trying to make, get our screen back here. Oh, OK. There, okay. there we go. Sorry, Dr. Yeah. Dr. No, no, that's fine. Dr. Jacobs has is, is helped me in this way every step of the way. OK, so um, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Dr. Sanu. Thank you for that introduction. That was uh, very nice. This is um, the purpose of this annual lecture. And uh, so it's my task and my pleasure to try to stimulate uh, everyone and excite and inspire students here as well as everyone else um, about their roles in building a better, more tolerant, more civil, more peaceful world. And indeed, uh, we, need, uh, we need that now as much as ever. It's funny, people, when I say I'm in peace studies, uh, people always say, well, we need more of that. And it didn't matter when I said that. I could have said that 25 years ago when they said the same thing. So indeed, we do, we do need plenty of that. And what I'd like you to walk away with is a sense that, that uh, we all have agency, a sense of uh, efficacy as individuals and collectively uh, as people. So I am titled this uh, People Powering Change. And uh, I will be in about six months launching a podcast series with conversations of people, individuals, and groups that have power change. So this has been, it's been nice to sort of prepare some of this in, for today as well as in preparation for the, for the podcast. Uh, so I think people typically think of psychologists uh, and abnormal behavior, uh, or maybe I should rephrase that. Uh, um, Psychologist in the field of psychology is quite broad and doesn't, uh, of course, only refer to clinical psychology. You can go right back to the founder of psychology, at least uh, in the US, William James, and find that he spoke about war and peace issues and felt that uh, we needed a substitute for war, something that, as he put it, inflames the civic temperament. and. Uh, for him, it was um, something akin to the Peace Corps, though he didn't have anything much to do with the Peace Corps, I don't think. Um, but he thought obligatory service would be a, a useful thing for everyone to have. And that's probably the case. If we could bring a diverse group of people together and have them work cooperatively toward common goals, uh, that, that would be a good recipe for peace, of course. Um, Psychology was also mentioned in uh, following World War I when the United Nations was born and the United uh, Nations Education, Science, and Cultural uh, so, uh, Organization uh, mentioned in, in its guiding uh, principles that war begins in the minds of men. And of course, it, it often does begin in the minds, and it's mostly men. And it's in the minds of men that we uh, have to build the defenses of peace. And I will also mention psychology in the context of Einstein, who spoke of the unleashed power of the atom changed everything, save our modes of thinking. And I underscore modes of thinking, which sounds like psychology has a role to play in this way, too. So the field of conflict resolution was born, and maybe it's not surprising, at the close of World War II and the beginning of what was then called the Atomic Age. And at that time, uh, conflict resolution, uh, one could refer to as also peacemaking, uh, was born. And this was the time of uh, ducking cover in the schools, where school children would duck under their, under their that's, not, that's not a very flattering picture of kids. That looks like they're being mistreated. But they're not. They're ducking under their desk, and they're covering their heads. Uh, as, this, as if this would protect them from those uh, intercontinental bombers that the Soviet Union had just developed, those bare bombers that could deliver a nuclear weapon uh, all the way you know, into the United States. 
So um, I somehow missed this. I shouldn't have. It was the 1950s. I think my teachers, maybe they were negligent. I don't know why we didn't do that. Maybe they didn't believe it. But uh, that's the 1950s. That's when the field of conflict resolution was born. Uh, in the field of conflict resolution, we make an important and very sharp distinction between violence and conflict. And it's important to keep in mind that, that conflict is something that is going on in our head. Uh, you can think of it as the perception of incompatible goals with somebody else or some other group. Uh, that's contrasted with uh, what we're looking at here, which is, you know, the physical side of violence. And maybe it's not surprising psychologists would, would make that sharp distinction between what goes on in the head and behavior. Uh, and, of course, we had emotions. But in this instance, it's important to keep these two things separate. And I'll refer to episode a few times, and you'll see why in a moment. Conflict and contrast is, as I mentioned, something that's going on inside people's head. Now, it might be a real conflict. There may be real incompatible goals. But it also might be the perception of incompatible goals. And together, conflict and violence form a cycle of violence that may be repeated over and over, particularly if the post-violent phase isn't handled very well. So importantly here, what goes on in our head doesn't have to be expressed behaviorally, of course, so that peacemaking can take place and interrupt that cycle of violence. That's the first place where we see peacemaking uh, playing a role. And so when I looked around to see where we might have peacemaking in a university context uh, locally, I noticed uh, uh, Missouri State University has this uh, friendly looking bear that uh, apparently engages in peer mediation and, uh, and, and trains conflict coaches. Uh, I guess the bear doesn't. But, and, uh, I thought the conflicts were kind of interesting because now we're looking at, you know, at what's going on in college, what kind of conflicts do we see? Roommate conflicts, neighbor disputes, work-related disputes, disagreements in student groups, conflicts with teachers or campus staff, conflicts in campus organizations, and many more. These are not violent, the, of course, these, but these are conflicts. So. Um, you know, I was trying to come up with, well, what would really be a local conflict we might look at? And I'm learning that uh, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of conflicts, although, although it became apparent to me when talking with Dr. Jacobs, we have a problem or had a problem with uh, parking around the square and the question of whether or not uh, we would have parallel parking uh, or uh, something in between. Uh, is that ring a bell to everybody? Okay, okay, okay. So I, I thought this was a big conflict. Uh, I thought I'd see more people going, yes, this is serious. So I hate to bring this up as an example, though, because this is the kind of thing that you can easily compromise on. And unfortunately, when people think of conflict, the first thing they often think of is compromise, which is what we discourage people from thinking. But in the case of, uh, you know, either parallel parking or parking at, I don't know, 90 degrees or something, or 45 maybe is okay, I don't know. But you, you think of, there's going to be a compromise somewhere. And uh, I guess maybe something like that's what, what happened, I don't know. Um, in any case, uh, well, think of this as uh, a typical conflict. Notice there's not violence there. And uh, you could, it could, this could be a roommate conflict, it could, you know, uh, this could be, this guy on the, on the right could be really messy, and the guy on the, the left could, could be really tidy or uh, OCD or something, you know, and you got these two roommates together and they're, yeah, it's not working out real well because they have this conflict. Okay, so here's, here's what we look at with conflict resolution, and I'll do it at the interpersonal level, but realize this can happen at multiple levels of analysis, and I'll look at some other levels too. So here we have, uh, uh, the, the sort of the bottom line, how do we deal with this, this sort of issue? Um, so we say engage in problem solving with a cooperative rather than competitive, with a cooperative attitude. 
uh, using I messages, I'll say more about that, and paraphrase to promote empathy and to arrive at mutually beneficial outcomes. That's a, that's a lot to remember, but now we'll walk through this sort of with uh, slides and it'll all kind of come together. Uh, but first I want to mention that an ounce of prevention is a, is a pretty good idea. Conflicts are ubiquitous. Uh, in fact, they can be handled in a way that leads to an improvement in relationships. In other words, they can be handled constructively. Or they might be handled <laughs> destructively so that it destroys a relationship or harms a relationship. So we have this potential with conflicts to go in either direction, constructive or destructive. And more often than not, it'll go into that constructive mode if we are uh, able to follow this sort of set of rules that, that can be applied here. Now in ongoing relationships, however, there, there is an ounce of prevention that can be applied, even though conflicts are ubiquitous. Consider personality, for example. Um, and consider somebody with whom you're going to have a long-term relationship. It would probably be a good idea, for example, at the top there, if you were open to new experiences, that the other person was also open to new experiences. Uh, and now this is referring to personality. So we're talking about behaviors that are relatively consistent across situations and over time. So we're not likely to change each of these traits. And if you want to study these more directly, just Google big five personality. These will pop up and they'll give you measures of it. You can see where you fall. Someone who's open to new experience versus closed is going to create problems over the long term and the short term. Extroversion probably doesn't matter much, though people have a propensity to be either extroverts or introverts or somewhere in between. Extroverts gain a lot of energy by being around people where introverts sort of burn out around people. They're exhausted after they're around a bunch of people. That probably doesn't make too much difference in a long-term relationship. Sometimes it works well when you've got an extrovert and an introvert. But this one, conscientious, people are not likely to change too much on that dimension. And that probably matters. If you have one side that's highly conscientious and the other one that's not, uh, you might expect lots of conflicts, some that are difficult to manage. And in a similar way, uh, we probably want everybody to be stable emotionally, so that's probably uh, the side of the scale we'd all like to be on. Agreeableness is an interesting one. It says, uh, if you're an agreeable person, you're likely to remain pretty agreeable throughout most of your life across most situations. If you're disagreeable, you're likely to be remaining like that too. Just something to keep in mind. And um, similarly, I, was, I will add in the, in the case of agreeableness, expectations matter a great deal. So that uh, one of the better predictors on psychological inventories about how long relationships will last has to do with expectations. And so that, uh, this sounds terrible, but low expectations is not a bad thing. Because then if you have low expectations, then whatever happens from the other side, anything positive, it's like, wow, I didn't expect that. That's fantastic. Uh, it's probably best to say, you know, sort of not low expectations, but, you know, keep them lower than what's likely to come your way. Uh, and I mentioned openness to experience, uh, uh, to new experiences. So this is the ounce of prevention thing. I mean, it, it, you often hear people say, well, you know, we don't really match on these dimensions. Uh, but you know what? Uh, he'll change. Uh, and you're shaking your head. No, <laughs> it's not because these are relatively permanent features of people's personalities. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, it is possible to uh, take a look at the kinds of ways in which people characteristically deal with conflict in particular. And it turns out that um, people have patterns. These are malleable in general. I mean, people might consistently 
withdraw from conflict, not like it, not want to face it, not want to manage it, deal with it. Other people might dominate when conflicts arise, and still others might submit. And notice each of these is uh, associated with a particular psychological consequence. So the person who's in a relationship who's withdrawing all the time is probably doing other things that are self-destructive as well. Whereas dominating uh, in that kind of relationship, we're talking about someone who's aggressive and seeks power over the other. And you can, you can have a, you know, an A matched with a B and an A and a C and an, you know, all these different possibilities. What we'd like to promote is engaging where the two people are uh, actively uh, engaging in discussing that conflict using the, the pattern I described earlier. There is one more pattern where people skip around and they sort of vacillate. Sometimes they dominate, sometimes they submit, sometimes they withdraw. So they have that kind of vacillating uh, type which is associated with anxiety. In all of these cases, when it's conflict resolution we'd like to do, we aim for engaging in joint problem solving. Uh, and this is true in, you know, in, in uh, all kinds of relationships. Uh, what we're going to try to do is say, I want to separate the people from the problem. People find this extraordinarily useful to keep in mind. That is, um, you know, there's a conflict, let's say, between us or between this group and that group. What you try to do is say, I want to separate the, the problem from the people. And I want to, in a sense, put it up here. And let's both look at that problem and let's, let's both face it and work toward resolution. So first, separating the people from the problem, treating it like something you can do joint problem solving on. And that's the first part. The second part is when you're stepping into this, you have a cooperative attitude, the notion that we're going to be able to cooperate uh, at some level and achieve a mutually beneficial outcome. And uh, that this sort of illustrates the uncooperative look. The, the cooperative attitude is not of this kind where it's, it's, it's thought to be like a zero-sum thing where if you gain X amount, then I lose X amount. It's sort of zero-sum thinking. Instead, it's a positive-sum arrangement. It's uh, you know, a situation where you, know, you, you can both win. It can be a win-win outcome. Uh, but you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to put the problem out there. You're going to have to engage with it. And you're going to have to engage in joint problem solving with this cooperative attitude. I like this notion of I messages. I, I know people find it very useful. I've seen them do it, um, move into this sort of mode where they're, they're starting the problem out by saying, I feel such and such when this and this happens, this or that happens, because, you know, explain that sort of thing. Uh, uh, this, by the way, shows the, the opposite kind of reaction where the finger's out like you. Uh, don't start with you. Uh, that's the uh, trigger. That's the trigger. Don't start with you. Uh, we like to see I messages, and uh, which simply start with my feelings. I feel when such and such and because. The paraphrase also is very, very helpful because uh, it illustrates that you understand the other side's point of view. Uh, I've uh, mediated uh, race relations on a, on a number of occasions. I find that one to be one of the hardest things to do for people, especially if it's heated. By the time they get finished paraphrasing what the other side said in order to illustrate that they're having empathy, they forget what they want to say. That just shows that most of the time we're not empathizing real well. So the idea is that side it says with an I message what they're feeling, and then this side paraphrases what that side said, and then expresses with an I message what they're feeling. And you just keep going back like that. It's, it slows the process down a great deal, but it's a really healthy slowdown. <laughs> so uh, 
the overall picture looks like, like this. We move from digging into positions to using empathy with eye messages, with paraphrasing, in order to get some sense of what each side's concerns are. Now, if you go to sort of the larger unit of analysis, say group level or international level, you'd, you'd be looking at interests. But essentially, you we're looking at the same process where you're working down from interests all the way down to common values and morals. Surprisingly, when you get down to this level, you find out that people have common values and morals. They're just operating out of a, a, a different set of, of concerns. And uh, the uh, desired end is to, to arrive at empathy. This is a particular kind of empathy, cognitive sort of perspective-taking empathy, as contrasted with uh, this kind of empathy, which is more like affective empathy. I'm feeling what you're feeling. But both types of empathy are really uh, useful to, to, uh, to use in a conflict situation. And here we arrive at this uh, mutually beneficial outcome. More often than not, it's a, a situation where both sides can gain rather than one side win and one side lose. Okay, and now keeping in mind that this can happen at multiple levels of analysis, I referred earlier to violent episodes, and here's why. I wanted to put that in, in a context where very often a conflict will occur, and then a violent episode will occur, and then we have a post-violence phase when all kinds of peacemaking can take place to make it possible to manage future conflicts more effectively. So for example, uh, again, trying to draw a bit from the local context, uh, when we had Michael Brown uh, as headlines around the country, and his death uh, in turn was a, certainly a violent event. Now, what happens after that violent event then is what matters. Uh, there's already been a conflict. There's already been violence. What's going to happen in the post-violence context now? And we saw that in that uh, post-violence con context at uh, University of Missouri, an action plan was developed and around race issues. And uh, it had uh, these points, paraphrasing here a bit, but um, it's interesting to note this, this uh, as a plan of, of, uh, to, to deal with uh, post-racial incident um, and I thought that was a, you know, a really uh, useful way of, of thinking about what, what do you do in the post-violence phase. Uh, and I understand here at this campus um, there weren't inc incidences following uh, the death of Michael Brown. And in part I think uh, that's probably attributed to what the campus climate was like before that but also how it was handled after that. I don't know the details of that, but I suspect that uh, there, was an, there was an open forum following it, or at least an opportunity for people to talk, and it didn't have to go to the point where you were arriving at some kind of uh, action plan. And my guess is that there was already a sense of equity and inclusion uh, prior to, and maybe even more afterwards. So. Um, that just illustrates the post-conflict arrangement. So with episodes of violence, we have the opportunity for peacemaking before a violent episode as well as during the post-violence phase. And in, in, within nations, when you have intergroup violence, very often the post-violence phase means reconciliation. Uh, you know, people have to reconcile before they can rebuild their societies, before they can rebuild their institutions. Uh, and that's actually been a, a big, big growth area in uh, humanitarian interventions internationally post-violence. So I'm emphasizing episodes of violence, and I want to contrast it with another kind of violence, and that's structural violence.
this was taken in Rio. And uh, of course, you're looking at whopping differences in wealth. And of course, along with that, whopping differences in health and just generally uh, human well-being. Uh, so this is structural violence. This is the kind of violence that also kills people, just as episodes of violence are capable of killing people. But it kills people slowly, over time, through the deprivation of human needs. And so we have really a growing set of problems, particularly within, within countries. Between nations, we're looking at uh, differences that are being uh, that are that are, that are uh, being mitigated over time, but within countries we're seeing growing disparities and uh, greater structural violence over time. So this is something we're looking at. Uh, it is um, ubiquitous, of course. Uh, it isn't something you can prevent, as you can prevent episodes of violence. Uh, this is something that you can mitigate, uh, as you can with episodes of violence, but it has that additional dimension that is, that is uh, structural, it's continuous, it's pervasive, and it can't be prevented. It is uh, summarized by Gandhi in this way. The earth provides enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. The kind of uh, approach to structural violence is not peacemaking. We're going to refer to that as peace building. Because you, you actually have to change the structures of a society here. You have to rebuild the structures, uh, the political, the economic, the social structures of a society. And so we've basically been dealing with a two by two matrix here with episodic violence and peacemaking, which is episodic as well. And then on the structural side, we've got structural violence and peace building. This was actually a table that, that I used some years ago in a book that was published. And it's available online at no cost. Uh, the publishers were kind enough to release this book uh, after they sold whatever number they wanted to sell. I think they had 3,000 they anticipated selling. They sold that, and then we asked them if we could have the copyright, and they said, yeah. I mean, uh, Wow, that's amazing. So uh, if you just Google Peace Psychology, that book will come up, and it'll be organized along the lines I just described with a two-by-two two matrix. Mostly what I want to focus on today, though, is this two-by-two two matrix uh, in regard to peacemaking and peace building. So we're not going to keep looking at the origins of violence and the origins of structural violence. And I'm going to try to keep in mind this, and keeping with the spirit of this new lecture, that uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And indeed, it's the only thing it ever has. I'm really surprised uh, that this is so true. I mean, I just recently did a piece for uh, a, a book that's on the psychology of human rights. And I was looking at disability rights, and another colleague was looking at women's rights, and. Uh, Another colleague was looking at climate change, and we had a bunch of different topics we were looking at. And uh, in each of those cases, movement toward peacemaking and peace building uh, was preceded by people movement, not by the politicians' movement. And it became increasingly clear to me that, that it's the people that move politicians. They sort of follow. I mean, that's probably not surprising, but when I started looking at it really carefully, uh, in documenting what was happening, uh, I, w I was surprised at the extent to which you can, that makes sense, that's the case. So let's start out over here for a moment with the uh, episodic violence and peacemaking, focus on peacemaking. It was in the 1970s that uh, students, and I'll focus mostly on students, made a, uh, an effort to, to extricate us from the Vietnam War, and it made a difference. Uh, and this was uh, the scene of Kent State University in 1970, where four students were killed uh, in a, student demonstrations were taking place in, in, at many universities around the country. And uh, while we didn't uh, 
remove ourselves from Vietnam right away, these movements did make a, make a difference. Now, we don't have anything quite like that going on now, but I do think we have some po polarization here, a conflict of, of the political polarization type, perhaps partly fueled by social media and by cable news that presents one side of the story. And you can choose which side you want to indulge in, you know, more or less all the time. It's always running. It's always breaking somehow, <laughs> you know. And so uh, you can just, uh, you know, tune in to, the, to whatever side you're interested in. I'm st it's also striking that uh, in social media, the algorithms are playing with us pretty, pretty severely, actually. I mean, if you, if, you, if you demonstrate that you like something, Better yet, demonstrate you're outraged at something. You'll get more of that something. Uh, and then it just continues so that we, each side keeps getting more of that something that produces the outrage. Because that keeps your eyeballs on it. And keeping your eyeballs on it means advertising dollars. So I mean, that, that's what they're after. Keep your eyeballs on your side. Keep clicking. Keep the outrage going. So I, th I think this is probably part of why we're seeing so much polarization. This is a conflict. It's something we face today. I'll give you an example from, oh, he can't resist doing a little psychological research here to tell you about a study. Um, imagine a situation where you have a proposal, and we have some fine folks here who can tell you more about this proposal. The, uh, this proposal essentially says, we probably ought to be reducing carbon in the atmosphere because of global warming. <clears throat> now, most politicians, in fact, uh, I'm going to say you're really hard pressed in Congress now to find a politician that's denying this. I've seen this change over time. Most will agree that, yes, uh, we're looking at global warming, it's because of carbon, and it's largely because of human behavior. And then the issue is, well, how do we move to something that uh, isn't fossil fuels if we're so concerned about this? And one answer is to say, well, let's put a fee on carbon. It's easily measured. You can do it at the source so that you don't have to do it at the pump where people will get upset. Tax the fossil fuel companies and uh, take that tax or call it a fee, whatever you want to call it, and then return it to the people because the prices are going to go up at the pump and they're going to go up for heating. So return that to the households. And then um, we'll expect that clean energy will be, have a competitive advantage. Actually, it'll mean leveling the play playing field for, for clean energy. So let's, let's do that. Now, if you put this proposition in front of people, and you say, here's where the psychology comes in. You say, okay, here's, here's the idea. We're going to tax the fossil fuel industry. It's going to be distributed by the Treasury Department to households as a dividend. Let's say 100% of it. Actually, it'll be a little cost for the Treasury to do this, but they've got most of this stuff already in place. So it's like 99.8% goes back to the people. And that will fuel clean energy. Very simple, straightforward proposal. And now I'm telling you that that's being proposed by a Republican. And you happen to be Democrat. Hmm, well, will it make a difference? Or let me turn it around. I'm telling you this is proposed by a Democrat. And you're a Republican. Will that make a difference? So, you know, psychologists are empiricists. They go out and they actually test this stuff. And here's what they find with that proposal. Forget the independents, they're not interesting. But look, <laughs> look over to the left. The Democrats are kind of interesting. They're kind of into it, yeah, okay. Uh, but if, look at the blue one now. If a Democrat proposes it, I like it better than if a Republican proposes it. And if you look at the two bars on the far right, you see generally Republicans aren't too enthusiastic overall. But if a Republican proposes, I'm far more enthusiastic about it than if a Democrat did. So what's going on here, huh? Is it, uh, is it policy that matters or is it party that matters? And of course you can 
it's probably it's probably party and probably more than this graph shows because their initial positions are probably determined to a large extent by the tribe they belong to. So here we have a case where um, this tribal problem exists around this important issue of climate change. So here, here's what we need to do. <laughs> here's the conflict resolution approach to this. We start with mutual empathy. This sometimes gets difficult, but this is what we do. We do mutual empathy, we start with our positions, we look at the concerns, and we find what are the moral foundations that are underlying the positions. Now this kind of work is, has been done uh, by a psychologist by the name of Jonathan Haidt. He's written a book on the righteous mind, a fabulous book. He talks about six moral foundations that I'll mention. Uh, caring, liberty, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And he points out that our ancestors had universal instincts. And these instincts still exist, but now we have names for them, and they're expressed as morals. So you can see what the caring instinct is, protecting others from harm or suffering, and the liberty instinct, and so forth. And the interesting thing is if you, if you quantify this so that you can measure the degree to which people have a, a, a caring moral foundation and you find out the degree to which they uh, embrace liberty, fairness, loyalty, and so on, you find a split between parties. And the split goes something like this. On caring and liberty, uh, Democrats come out really high. And on loyalty, authority, and sanctity, Republicans come out really high. So if you quantify this and you measure the strength by the thickness of the line in this particular graphic, look at how thick the line is for Democrats on the first couple in particular, and how the lines, by comparison, for Republicans are thicker on the far three, or on, the, on your right, loyalty authority and sanctity. So the most sacred value for liberals, care for victims of oppression, while for the social conservatives, it's preserve the institutions and traditions that sustain a moral community. So we're looking at common moral foundations, but different emphases. And that's what we try to get at as we work our way down to the foundations in a uh, conflict resolution arrangement. Now, things have gotten a little more complicated because we've had a rise of populism more recently. And that's created an enormous divide in society now. And, uh, in particular, what we're looking at is the, the rise of, of right-wing populism. And here's how it's defined, at least by a couple of political scientists. Right-wing populism evokes a nostalgic, retrospective nationalism and claims to speak for regular people anxious about social, cultural, and economic change that's often attributed to the presence, or presence and social ascendance of race and ethnic minorities. So I've been curious about who's dealing with this issue, because this is a very uh, recent phenomena, but it's a fairly deep divide. And I've been looking around for organizations that are powering people to deal with this kind of division. And I've only been able to find one that seems to be fairly effective, and it's called Hands Across the Hills. It's bringing people together from Leverett, Massachusetts, and that's Western Massachusetts, and um, people from coal mining country in Eastern Kentucky, across the hills. And they're going from one place to the other and they're doing dialogue, and they're finding out the different perspectives of one another. Once again, they're working this empathy model uh, where they're trying to get down to fundamental 
sorts of concerns that people have and the uh, fundamental foundations of uh, morality that are in play. Uh, so it looks something like this. I think it was the election of uh, 2016 that brought this out most clearly, so I'd, I'll put it up that way. We'll call uh, on, my, on my, on your left we have the liberal elite and on the right we'll have the right-wing populists. And we'll, we'll bring a ref in here. Maybe you should have pads on, I don't know. And then uh, the ref will try to move from positions, concerns, to moral foundations. I think what, where we're at uh, with this particular program, it looks to me, and I want to explore it a little more with the founders, students have a great deal of involvement in this program. And I think that they're at the level of understanding. They're, they're trying to get at the concerns that each side has. So uh, when I've looked at their narratives, to get some sense of that, I, I put them out, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to make these binaries because they don't perfectly uh, match a binary kind of distinction. But you'll see the differences. Uh, the liberal elite, when you look through the narratives, uh, you're seeing that they're talking about globalization as a good thing. Strong lead leaders, that, from their view, endangers uh, democratic institutions, and. Uh, they feel they're doing fine as the, economy, as the economy becomes more automated. Now you can imagine the binaries on this from the right-wing populists. Uh, no, nationalism's good. Uh, strong leaders can restore our respect for ourselves. And things were good for me in the past, but now uh, not so much. Um, so we're getting this, this, this contrast. President Trump speaks nothing but lies. I welcome cultural and racial diversity and change. The arrival of migrants makes America strong. President Trump speaks his mind. Racial diversity and cultural change is a threat to my way of life. And aliens are a drag on our economic system. Yeah, it's in, the language is important too, isn't it? It's interesting. Aliens, you think of, uh, yeah, I think of aliens. So, a liberal lead, I trust well-educated leaders who are articulate. The values of secular humanism guide my life. Coal is dying and climate change is an existential threat. I'm suspicious of articulate leaders and like plain talk. Authority, including the Bible, guides my life. And coal has a future and climate change is a myth. So we, we, we are polarized, I think quite polarized. Even, uh, well, you can do this with a range of issues. One where it stands out a great deal is guns. You can imagine that one, right? The gun difference, the gun divide. So you have on the one hand the Parkland students, you know, where students were massacred. Uh, what's it, more than a year ago now, I think. Uh, yeah, in southern Florida. Uh, and you have them as sort of, the, their parents really do have some wealth. It, Parkland's a, a school that has a great deal of wealth. You could think of a lot of the folks here as a, the liberal elite, although a lot of them are Republicans, maybe wouldn't see themselves like that. But you do have the, the Parkland students I can put there. And over here, by the way, I, did, I, I meant to put, uh, I meant to put the, uh, under that, uh, the, on, on your right, are superintendents being trained. Uh, so these are, these are school superintendents. So they're being trained in, in the use of guns. So we have quite a division there, too. Now, if you can figure out how to bridge this divide in our country, I think you're doing really well, because it's a very deep one. And uh, yet, I do think that the kinds of programs that bring people together, that allow them to talk about these things, that empathi where empathy is exercised and you get to common kinds of concerns and values uh, can only be helpful. Okay, so let's go to this one, the structural side. Now here we're talking about peace building. We're talking about dealing with issues of social justice. I was, uh, interested to note in something that uh, we had 
published recently that it was a hundred years when women, uh, you know, when the women's suffrage movement before it finally reached its goal. So we're talking about uh, persistence, and we're talking about um, certainly not a one-off. And, and a similar thing you could say about peacemaking too. It's never a one-off because conflict is it always arises. So you, you know, in a similar way, it takes a, a lot of, in a sense, small wins that uh, accumulate over time. Same was true for the disability movement uh, with the banner uh, from Martin Luther King saying, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The disability movement also uh, took a bunch of small wins that uh, cohered and accumulated over time before accessibility became an issue for, for building codes and the like. But it was students who drove to the civil rights issue to a large extent, promoting segregation in public places. And it wasn't just segregation at lunch counters, it was segregation of parks, and it was segregation of public libraries, it's segregation of restrooms and restaurants and drinking fountains and all kinds of things leading to the, uh, the um, civil rights bill that uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed in 1964 was also students that led the Voting Rights Act and through the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, teaching citizenship classes and taking people to the polls to vote uh, and signing them up to vote. Uh, and with that, the Voting Rights Act that removed the citizen, uh, the, the requirement to take a citizenship test, among other things. Internationally, it was students who played an enormous role in dismantling apartheid, the uh, system, the system of legal discrimination and segregation that took place in South Africa. These are students at UC Berkeley who rallied around the idea of having their university divest uh, their investments in South Africa. This was happening at universities all around the United States at that time. And ten years, some ten years later, uh, apartheid was dismantled in South Africa. It was students who did the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia as the uh, Soviet Empire was unraveling. Uh, Czechoslovakia was still a communist country. It was students who brought democracy uh, among other factors, but students were really pivotal in the Velvet Revolution that brought uh, representation and voice of people to matters that affect their well-being. Uh, you know, like a velvet glove, it was so smooth, it just worked out really well. Right now what we're seeing in Hong Kong uh, is largely a student uprising, concern about the future and uh, whether or not uh, people in the future will have democracy, whether they'll have voice and representation, uh, and whether they'll have universal suffrage. Right now, the chief executive isn't chosen by the people. Uh, so they're looking for universal suffrage now and a continuation of this universal suffrage into the future. And finally, I want to mention uh, a movement that combines both peacemaking and peace building. <coughs> peacemaking and peace building. And a, and a movement that's driven increasingly by youth, too. And here, and here I'm talking about climate justice and climate change. Uh, it's, it's remarkable to see how many youth are, are joining, <coughs> joining this movement and speaking out. Uh, about their concerns on climate change. And I mentioned earlier um, with that graphic, the uh, carbon fee. Um, this is a proposal by um, the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, it's largely a, a peaceful movement in that, in that people meet with their representatives 
in a peaceful way and uh, exercise empathy. But it's also a social justice movement because we're talking about intergenerational justice issues. Um, because, um, you know, uh, the current generation use of fossil fuel, uh, of course, makes life difficult for subsequent generations. So this citizens' climate lobby is a grassroots, nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization, and it's focused around policies that are designed to address climate change. There are some 125,000 volunteers in 52 countries. In the U.S., there are 545 local groups. The closest group to you is in Colombia. And where are the folks from Colombia, from the CCL, Colombia? So we have a few folks here from the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, CCL maintains that burning fossil fuels should not be free, and therefore, advocates uh, advocates putting a fee on carbon, which will drive down carbon emissions, and therefore level the field for clean energy innovations. I already mentioned that model. They're operating out of this particular model. This is the proposal. This is actually a piece of legislation. This is also actually a bill that's been sponsored by a number of representatives, H.R. 763. So that scheme I just showed you is a bill in Congress now. Uh, in CCL, we'd like to say that uh, this is an effective way to combat climate change. It's, uh, it's good for people. It's good for their health. It's good for the planet. Uh, it actually puts revenue in people's pockets. It's overall revenue neutral. That is, uh, it's not adding to a deficit. And uh, it's advocated by like all those people who show up voluntarily to, in Washington to uh, sit down with their representative. And I think the most uh, interesting thing about it is the way the approach that's taken is to sit down and, and to try to understand the representative's point of view and from there uh, get some sense of uh, where common ground lies. These are student leaders involved in CCL. There are student chapters at a lot of universities. They're emphasizing peacemaking and peace building demonstrating appreciation to their member of Congress. They use listening skills, they clarify policy, they show respect, build relationships over time, and of course in the process they're building a sense of personal and, and collective efficacy. Um, so I think uh, this, this fits in well, I think, with, with what was uh, hoped for with, with uh, Dr. Sanu, I hope. Uh, and his, his uh, wish to see that uh, we build a, a better, more tolerant, and more civil, and more peaceful world. That's it. Thank you.